Friends from the Road. You are now listening to the Friends from the Road podcast. Gaining new friends along the journey. Sharing stories that inspire, encourage, and motivate. Friends from the Road podcast. Now here is your host, Daniel Hurd. Hey folks, before we get started today, I wanted to give you guys a heads up. This episode was done a little bit different, actually a lot different than my normal ones. One, this is in collaboration with 303 Endurance. Originally, they were going to do an interview directly on me, and I met Kyle, which I shared on my social media pages um, while I was riding on North Tabletop in Golden, Colorado. And his story was so powerful. I had told Bill of 303 Endurance about him and how I wanted to do uh, an episode of my own with him. So we instead took the opportunity to have a conversation with all three of us and really let Bill kind of um, interview me and Kyle. And, uh, you know, it's really a powerful episode. I'm really excited to share Kyle's story. Uh, it's so inspiring because of the fact that uh, Kyle used to be over 400 pounds. So um, with that being said, I don't want to get too much into the details. Definitely stick around. And here's the episode. Perfect. Well, welcome to Garage Talks. We are take two, unfortunately, but that's okay. We learned a lot about each other the first time. A little something weird here, but now we've learned tons of things. We can dial right in. And I want you to meet Kyle and Dan. And this is going to be a fun pod or video cast about a cool journey that you started, Dan, three years ago. Yeah. Riding across the country, hitting every state, not just riding across the country. Yeah, not for just suicide right. prevention, or suicide awareness was the main mission. Yes, it was. And uh, you have quite a background, you know, in the military, had some suicide attempts yourself. Yeah. Talk about the big picture, and, and we'll talk about how we all got together, because this is kind of the most eclectic group I think I've ever had to talk to. This is awesome. Hey, well, it's an honor. I, uh, you know, it's awesome for me. Cycling has been really powerful for me. Uh, but what led to all that was, uh, again, like you said, I attempted suicide three times. I was, I was playing a fourth and a friend got me on a bicycle and uh, he kept making me go for bike rides and it just kind of evolved. I was, I was overweight. I was like 272, 80 at the time and um, yeah, he just kind of got me on a bike. It, it got me to the point where I needed to uh, keep going. Uh, I actually, after our third bike ride, I did 166 miles. Mm. He uh, <clears throat> he really was tired of me complaining. Is what it really was down to. Yeah. I was complaining about the miles we had already done and what we had left. And I was like, I just don't think I can do this. And uh, so yeah, he ended up uh, stopping. And saying, dude, it's left, right, left, right. It's one pedal at a time. Just think of that. And so literally that's what I did the rest of my ride. And after that ride, I, it kind of carried over from ju not just biking to my daily life. And it kind of really made me want to keep keep biking because I, I felt accomplished after that huge ride. Um, so, yeah, I, I kept going, doing that. And then it, it kind of evolved uh, the... After my suicide attempt, my therapist was like talking to me, trying to figure out things because I wanted to get off medications. I, I really am not a fan of meds. Why were you on meds? Was this something out of your military, PTSD type of thing? Uh, so the issues that I dealt with were uh, childhood traumas, um, which were from uh, physical, sexual, mental abuse to uh, military issues that I've dealt with from people being blowing their faces up and other issues that I've dealt with. But... Um, it's, uh, just a mix of things that kind of built up over time. And, um, also my last one was financial struggles. So, uh, you know, financial daily struggles is a huge one for people, but yeah, all those things kind of just piled up and, and yeah, my third suicide attempt happened after that attempt, my friend got me on the bike. He, he kind of saw that I was struggling, but I was telling everybody I was good. And, and deep down I was planning that forward. So, okay. um, so the meds were because I, the suicide attempt, I ended up in the hospital and got put on the meds. Gotcha. Um, so that's kind of where that kind of went into. But yeah, they, uh, they, I see the importance of them and the immediate need, but I just don't see the need for them long term and I just wanted to get off. Yeah. So the therapist for trying to find things that was uh, positive times for me, um, as crazy as it sounds for a lot of people to say, my military time was the best time of my life. 
Okay. Um, I never thought about suicide. I never felt really depressed. I was always doing awesome things and, and, and learning and doing a lot of cool stuff. And so it, it wasn't an issue during the time. Uh, it, was, it was when I transitioned out. Okay. But it, it Did was, you lose a purpose maybe? Was that part of it? Yeah, I think that's a lot of, a lot of I think that's a lot of people's issues is uh, not knowing our purpose or not feeling we have a purpose. Right. right. The routine for certain. Routines. The routine. Definitely. Yeah. Routine's almost everything. The looking back though, before you were in the military, did you sense any sort of anxiety maybe or some kind of lost feeling? So my first suicide attempt was before I joined. Oh, it was? Yeah, so I was 17. Okay. Um almost 18 years old when I did my first suicide attempt. Oh, okay. Um, and then, yeah, that one was never reported, so I, I was able to join still. I see. Hmm. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, so you can't join if you try that. Okay. Yeah, I would assume so. Sense. I don't know. Yeah, sure. right. yeah I'm <laughs> right. <laughs> Interesting. So, you, so you're so you in this that. one pedal at a time. You yes. decided to, to, to then launch across the United States. Why, why did you want to hit every state? What was important about that? Well, so that's... Uh, so per, during that process with the therapist, he, uh, we're trying to find those times. The people I served in the military with were more of a family to me than my own real family in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, we had to watch each other's back and keep each other alive. So, you know, for me, he was like, it sounds like you need to go visit some of your friends that you served with. And it was like two days later, the guy that got me on a bike was like, man, when I was your age, I wanted to ride my bike across the country. Ah. And like light bulbs, fireworks, whatever you want to call it, started going off in my head. And yeah. I was just like, I want to go see the guys that I served with, the people I served with on a bicycle. Got it. So it was like September, October of 2017. I started mapping out like where the friends that I kept in touch with, where they lived. And uh, they lived in 35 states at the time. And to get to those 35 states, I had to do 42. I see. And uh, people were like, oh, you should do them all. I was like, all right, I'll do 45. Uh, and that was because I had bias against three states, and, uh, <laughs> huh. and I didn't want to go through them at the time, and, and two of them I still am okay with not ever seeing again, but <laughs> we won't talk about those okay. states. Well, we should uh, guess. Everybody guess. Yeah, right? you can guess. But, so that's how it all sort of mapped out. It became this thing where you're going to... Yeah, so do- over time, it kind of was like, all right, how am I going to do this? Like, I can't do that all in one year, because um, my goal was to do 25,000 miles in three years. Ultimately... I was thinking, I'm going to do the circumference of the earth just in the United States. Okay. 25,000 miles in three years and some change ends up being about 22 miles a day. Um, but this was continuous. It wasn't like you do a couple states, go home. Do no. Home. Yeah, you were continuous. just in a continuous. So I actually, uh, back in April, was the first time I went back home uh, to Massachusetts and New England uh, in three years. Because you were coming off an injury, which we'll get to in a yeah. second, which is kind of how we're all here. Yes. Because you were in Utah... Yes. Last summer. Uh, yeah, I was there. Or October. October. October, yeah. And Kim Suthwan, who does a lot of stuff with 303, of course, she was out kind of in her own journey and met you in Monument Valley. Yeah, with a couple of the guys that were riding with me. Yeah. And, uh, and then you were with a different bike. You had a big trailer that was how long? Yeah, so that thing was just shy of 14 feet. It was uh, just shy of three feet wide. And it weighed just about 350 pounds. Okay, so you were you were 44 states in at that point. Yeah, just crossed into my 44th of Arizona. And okay, so you were 43rd of in Utah. Yes, and that's when you met Kim, and you guys got to know each other a little bit. Because I remember she we were talked, and she's like, "Man, I met Lieutenant Dan." I'm like, "What are you talking about, Lieutenant Dan?" And she kept talking about you, and then you guys had a good time. Chat. I think you spent a little bit of time. We rode together a little bit, right? Uh, so she. Didn't really per se ride with us. She ended up doing her own thing, but uh, we ended up camping together. So oh, that's we were at nice. campground together, yeah. and then uh, we went out to eat together. We, yeah. spent a, we spent a good amount of time yeah. in like a really like a twenty four hour period, right? And uh, even maybe like thirty, but it, it wasn't that long of a period. And then we left that campground, uh, me and two other cyclists, and we crossed into Arizona that morning. Okay, saying goodbye to them. Uh, and then the next day is, uh, I got hit by a car. So you're cruising down the highway. Yeah. US 160 or 163. And crossing in, you were in Arizona. Yeah. Got hit from behind, I presume. Yes. As far as I, been I mean, told, uh, just wrecked your trailer, launched you. Yeah. I got thrown, uh, based off GPS and reports and everything. I got about a hundred feet down the road and roughly about 50 feet off the road. So, so this car just plows into you. 
And if I remember right from our conversation, um, they didn't even have, they didn't cite them. They didn't do. Yeah, they didn't. Uh, like nothing happened to them. They actually, as weird as it's hard to say, and I, uh, you know, the police report put me at fault. <laughs> That's crazy. You just happened to be on the side of the road and get hit by a car, and it's your fault. Yeah, uh, right well, the, the, uh, not that it's a reason or, you know, the state trooper didn't know that cyclists were allowed on roadways. Oh. Uh, okay. So that was her reasoning for putting me at fault. Okay. Um, she didn't know that the Arizona law was three feet and that I'm allowed on U.S. roadways on the right side of the road. Um, that I have to stay in that portion of the lane. Right. So I, everything I did was legally in my legal limit, but she didn't know that. So you, so you end up in the hospital for a couple of weeks. Yeah, 13 days. I uh, ended up having to have three surgeries on my legs. Um, I had pretty extensive road rash where the skin got ripped off my legs. I had road rash on my kneecaps, on the bones itself. Okay. Um, just a lot of torn up and I got a TBI from it as well. Okay. Um, so yeah, it just kind of was not fun. Thankfully, I don't remember any of it. Yeah. Uh, I got med flighted to Flagstaff, Arizona. Okay. Um, so that's where you went. That's where I ended up staying. Okay. And uh, I spent about two weeks there and during that process, I made arrangements to go to Texas to spend some time with a, uh, a veteran that I met about a year before that. Okay. Um, on the road. And uh he, he offered a place for me to stay and, you know, heal and, and kind of learn new trades because now I'm doing podcasting as well. So, so how, did, how does it – you you had three suicide attempts. You – and you almost get killed on a bike trying to prevent suicide. What was kind of good in your – how did that play out in your mind a little bit? What was the, what's the irony there almost? It's uh, – there's so much irony to it because, one, I, I didn't appreciate life before, obviously – um, I am so thankful to be alive after this accident. Like, I'm thankful that I survived the, the suicide attempts too. But right, um, my mom, for instance, my mom, uh, she, I tell her I'm I'm good. I'm not gonna commit suicide ever again. Um, but a lot of, for a long period of this journey, she she thought I was doing it to to hopefully die by get being hit by a car. Really? She, yeah, she told me that after the accident. Wow. And uh, so when I told her, I was like, no, Mom, I'm so happy to be alive and, and given yet another opportunity to, to make a difference. Right. Uh, she finally realized that I, that I, I'm, I actually want to be alive. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy just to see how, how much of a change I, I've had in really four years. Um, five, what was it? Five years from the was it getting hit an even bigger change to change you even more than you ever would have guessed? Um, not particularly, not particularly in the okay. sense, uh, not the accident itself. The accident really made me realize that I enjoy life so much that I want to protect it as much as I can. Yeah. Uh, in the sense that I'm okay with not riding on the roads around distracted drivers anymore. Right. Right. Um, kind of the reason why I got a little bit of fat tire bike, a mid fat tire. So I have more options to go off roads yeah. uh, or do gravel, dirt roads. Um, instead of these U.S. roadways where I was before. It's also why I didn't build a new camper, um, which was amazing when I had it. It was a great camper. Yeah, the pictures are incredible. Uh, it slept great. It was, I had six feet. I had a six-foot-long bed with three, uh, two foot wide. That's crazy. Three-inch foam mattress in there. It was awesome. Um, it was insulated, so I could sleep in it in the hottest part of the day. Yeah. I could sleep in it during hailstorms, which I did 20 times. Um, you should so maybe you should make those for sale for people. You know, a friend of mine, the one that I built them with in Fort Collins, we we were actually thinking about making them. Be kind of cool to to sell them and then uh, using proceeds to help like make a, a more basic version for like homeless population. Oh, <laughs> so, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, you know, so ideas. Who knows yeah. if we'll ever actually do it? Uh, that would like be really cool. Bike packing is one thing, but like a camper that you tow, that's yeah. that's next level. Yeah. So you that's so you. Good. And then you were writing for a cause. You started a 501c3. I did. I started, uh, so I, I didn't start for my own cause. I started for other causes for suicide awareness. Yeah. And initially when I started, it was for like like five different charities for different, like completely different things. Right. Um, because at the beginning of my journey, I was uh, I was ashamed to bring up what I was, what I was really doing it for. Right. And uh, uncomfortable to talk about that at the first so I was doing it for suicide awareness, 
uh, Bikes Not Bombs. I was Bikes doing, Not Bombs. Okay. <laughs> which is an organization in Boston. That is an, or- that is an organization. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Um, <laughs> Interesting. Well, and they send bikes to like Africa and South America. Really? South America. Okay. They, they rebuild bikes and send them to them. So wow. Bikes Not Bombs was awesome. I did uh, To Write Love on Arms for Suicide Awareness. I did uh, uh, the Kids Charity for Children's Kids. It's a research that they do in June. Okay. Uh, so I did that for them as well. So you figured you'd just do it for yourself finally. Right? Yeah, I was. Uh, it was a guy in Boston. I was still in my first, technically my first date. And um, I was there and this guy, I always tell him, it's like he was like a five-year-old kid to me. You know, like when a kid's just wanting to learn something, they're just like, why? Why? Yeah, why? why? Yeah. What? A, I don't get it. Why? Yeah. This guy, and he was in his 60s, was literally doing this to me. And he's just, he's like, so what are you biking for? I'm like, oh, I just wanted to travel the country, visit the people I served. He's like, that's cool, but why? Right. And he did this to me for like 30, 40 minutes. Oh, okay. And it was just like, to the point where I was, my blood was starting to boil. <laughs> and, and he was doing it purposely, but right. like not purposely. Right. And I was just like, because I tried to kill myself and I need this. And, and it just like, came out. Yeah. And it was just, he's like, Valley, thank you. That's why. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's like, pretty liberating, that though, isn't it? It was. It, because I finally said it, he's like, tell people that. And that's when it really started. Yeah. So the first, like, three, four weeks of my journey traveling in my own state and into Rhode Island a little bit, um, you know, I was just doing my own thing. But once I left Boston and really started going through the states, it was for suicide awareness. I still wasn't comfortable saying it was for me. Yeah. Um, at that point in my life, I knew like 30, I think it was 35 or 36 people that had committed suicide uh, from wow. my childhood growing you up. You knew 35 people. Military, yeah. Wow. It's uh, 39 now. Wow. Um, I'm sorry. That's terrible. Four people since I've been on my journey. Wow. Um, so you, wow. So you, but you said earlier how this journey, you've, you've actually inter- encountered a lot of people who have been thinking about suicide or have tried suicide or were and, in the process of going to do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I've been very fortunate. Uh, the day before my accident, I did my 80th suicide intervention. 80. Um, and it, it was, it, you know, for me, it was never some. I wasn't going out there to try to save lives. I, I started this to save my own. Yeah. So the fact that I was, I was feeling better. I was really making myself, you know, do things that I, felt were what I needed and right. then to be able to pass that information oh, to other people to, oh. they, they weren't all in person. Some of them were through social media. Some of them, uh, because I've been on the news a lot of times and done interviews and stuff like right. that. Um, some of them weren't even people that were actually in need of the help. It was somebody that was concerned about somebody they knew that needed help. Right. Um, so that would be like a three way call just to get the things. So people are, but people are tracking you you're making things happen you're on the news like you said it's yeah and I, I was doing before covid i was a public speaker as well so i did a lot of speeches oh okay uh, from uh elementary middle school to through, all the way through college to churches and um rotary clubs uh, private clubs all those different things and so it's just anywhere that they would allow me to, to have a conversation and, and share my story but not really just my story but yeah um you know the story of hope for people so the through the bike Obviously, you run into folks like Kyle. We'll get to you in a second, Kyle. But you you spend your day, you, three, you think, I think you said earlier, 20, 30, 40 miles a day, maybe sometimes 60, just tooling through your, your route yeah. or whatever that might be. And you might get diverted to somebody's garage and get stuck in front of a camera, I suppose. But but tell us about, like, you were, uh, you met Kyle. And yeah, so just random just door like, table mountain, right? Yeah, just like with meeting Kyle. That's how it is everywhere I go. I, I meet new people every day. Uh, a lot of it has to do with that sign that I have, make a stranger smile. Yeah, look at that smile. I mean, um, how does that not attract? Even if it wasn't all the gear on the bike, it, that sign just really, mm. uh, even if someone doesn't say a word to me, if, if they see that sign, they're smiling. I have, a hat, I have a hat I should give you. It says, it says make, Mer- uh, make uh, cycling arrow again, make America arrow again. It's, yes. it's, it's like a takeoff on the Trump hat, but uh, this says not arrow, but... Uh, no, I'm definitely not arrow <laughs> at all. Um, especially with, but the way I look at it is the sign doesn't really add much of a resistance no, because of all kidding. the bags and everything sure. else. 
Actually, you're fine. I'm just teasing, but... No, yeah. I'll actually, I get a lot of people that, you know, because it's so flat. Right. But, yeah, uh, I look at it as a challenge. Right. And, again, it's always one pedal at a time. So right. it doesn't matter if it's 70 mile an hour winds hitting me or, or if it's zero. If you like it when artists use repurposed materials to create working products, then you need to check out Stratosol. Jason, the founder and creative genius of Stratosol, creates all his designs by using repurposed bicycle inner tubes and other materials into personal and bicycle accessories. I personally have two extra large hydro buckets and a great under seat bag that are high quality and made to last. They are affordable. Plus, you're supporting an independent artist. So if you want durable, expertly handcrafted products made from upcycled materials, then check out Stratosol. Link in the description to see all the top-notch products. Now, enjoy the episode. And then, like through coincidence, Kyle here, and you have a, oh, yeah. quite a story. Sorry. You, um, you, just, you met Kyle. I met Kyle on North, uh, North Tabletop Mountain there. Uh, I was going with a friend that I'm staying with here in town um, that I met actually in Moab. And we were going for a mountain bike ride. I stripped all my gear off my bike. And um, we went there, and we pulled in the parking lot. He's getting his bike ready to go. We were getting set up. He got on the trail, like, literally right before us. And uh, our paths crossed literally, like, 500 feet down the path because he went. He was getting ready to go the wrong direction. The wrong Again. And uh, we went this way, and he's like, you guys mind if we tag along? Or you got, and he tags along, and we obviously we don't care. Uh, but we were, we were on a short schedule, so we, had a, we were only doing a short ride, and. He had a lot more time. So. When did the when did the stories come out? Because Kyle Kyle has his own story that there's a lot of yeah, related, relatability right? to your story. So uh, so what I always do is I always try to strike up conversation. So I think I started saying like asking his name and stuff like that. And what he, like why is he, why is he cycling? He started telling us about uh, moving from Indiana uh, to Colorado recently and how he's just looking for people that are as excited about cycling as he is and. And activities oh, yeah. and stuff, so. But the bike saved your life, didn't it? Oh, more than, yeah. Well, not really. I mean, well, in a different way. Yeah, in a different way. Yeah, not necessarily more than. But, um, yeah, uh, um, with how we met, just real quick, uh, whenever I pulled up to the parking lot, all trails had me go the wrong way four times on four different trails. So my girlfriend and I, we would ride up the downhill part to only get to the peak to ride down the fire lane part because we would be so tired. Yeah. So I pull up to Golden. I'm like, well, today's the day I find somebody to pretty much ride with. So I was looking around. It was pretty early, so nobody was out. So I decided to send it and go up. Decided to go the wrong way, and then they saved my day. Yeah. But, um, yeah, like, just immediately, like, as we were riding up the entire uphill, we were just keeping a nice pace and just, just talking the entire time. And that just gave me more and more, more and more, more fuel to the fire that this guy's really cool because we can just converse and ride up this mountain like we can definitely send it down it like heck yeah this is this is who i need to be talking to but um but yeah i uh i used to be 426 pounds and then i lost um about 200 let's see here, i'm two, two about 208 so 426 i lost about 224 pounds um but pretty much I uh, used to sell weed back when I was like 16. So I turned 16, I smoked weed for the first time, and I decided, you know, may as well help people find it. <laughs> uh, seeing it as, as it is medicine, it doesn't really hurt too many people. So um, I'd find it for some people here and there. And then when I turned 21, I um, caught a case for selling one gram of marijuana to a confidential informant. And then I caught a year in prison for my first and only offense. So whenever I went to prison was when the very first time like I ever stepped on the scale that would weigh me. So I said 426. So I said, all right, well, I have a year to figure this out. So um, instantly, like at lunch and stuff, I'd give away to the dessert for veggies. I would fast every day. I would do push-ups. Um, first time I did played Monopoly for push-ups, I owed 15 push-ups. I did those 15 push-ups that night. And man, for like Three weeks, everything just hurt. I was like, wow. <laughs> Monopoly really, for push-ups. That's really is, that a, me, is that yeah. a prison thing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, you <laughs> land so on for laying a venture place, you oh, have 40 yeah. push-ups? You land on income tax, essentially, and that's 20 push-ups. Okay. Um, but if you lose, that's some push-ups. Pretty much everything's push-ups. Huh. Um, so, yeah, I went from 426 to about 250 when I got out. So then I got out and I didn't really have a focus. Like I, I would play video games before that for like 12 hours a day. So I got out in the new Halo game 
just wasn't good. So I was like, wow, I'm really in a rut. I, I have no video games that I want to play for 12 hours. So what do I do for 12 hours? So apparently, I guess I just ate and just hang out, uh, hung out. So like I gained 100 pounds. Oh, no, I, I didn't. So right when I got out of prison, I found out that my grandma, she was on antidepressants and she kept wanting to change them. So she would tell the doctor, I want off of them. Boom, he would give her a different one. So the fourth time she told him, um, she told the doctor, I went off of him. He said, okay, take this one. She went home. She said, you know what? I'm not taking it. The next day she shot herself. Oh. Yeah. So my dad called, <clears throat> told me that. And, and um, she was pretty much my best friend outside of my parents. So I pretty much just got real sad. Like, not like take my own life sad, just sad. Just like, what's the point? So I guess the point is just play some video games I don't really like, eat a lot of crappy food, and just sit here. So I got up to about 350 pounds in about a year, so I gained about 100 pounds. So then one day I woke up and the blinds were tilted just so, it felt like prison bars were hitting me. So I was like, man, I feel like in literal prison right now, like why? And uh, so that day I was scheduled with my girlfriend at the time to go to Brown County. So we go to Brown County State Park in Indiana, and uh, we visit the state park, I'm like, wow, the nature's where I need to be but I do not like hiking. So we're leaving the state park and there's a bike shop right there and they had fat tire bikes. So I was like, huh, those look thick, pretty hefty. <laughs> I bet they could take me in a mountain. So uh, I researched them for about eight hours that night, find out the salsa bear, the salsa bear grease, the weight limit's 450 pounds. So I went and bought it two days later from Indie Cycle Specialist. And you were what, about 350 then? Yeah, I was about 358. So I wow. went 358, bought two fat bikes, one uh, one with 4.8 like tires, front suspension, salsa, bear grease, it was epic. And then I bought the backup one for uh, my girlfriend or for any friends, my buddy Griffin, who was like my best friend at the time, would come send it. So uh, me and Griffin had the bikes, went to, uh, South Southwest Way Park there around Indy in Indianapolis, my, probably one of my favorite parks. So we go to Southwest Way Park at 8 p.m. We pull up and the sun's starting to go down. So like we get the bikes out. I'm like, all right, you ready, Griffin? And he's like, bet. So we get on the trail and we we uh, take, I guess, the, the easy way in. So we roll the easy way in and we finally get back there and the sun's going down and all of a sudden this I call it the downhill jam. We're at the bottom of it, and you just see this epic sculpted downhill jump track. And I'm like, what? Like, what? Like, already am I just stoked about the flow trail, let alone the downhill? Like, what? So uh, the sun's going down. We do the downhill once. Griffin almost dies. And I'm like, wow, this is like, there was like no learning curve for me. Like, it was like riding bikes. It was bikes like, again. like, like, is oh, this your yeah. game mentality? It, it, was like, just... it was like I was 10 again, because like, uh, I rode bikes here and there, like down at the skate park or just around the neighborhood. I'd ride my BMX bike. But man, like getting back on a bike, like, I forgot about everything. The first two minutes, it was just like, wow, I'm 10 again. So I feel, um, like, I feel like that's like similar to me. And I feel like that's a lot of people. It's, we, Once you get we, back we get, on the bike. We, we lose focus of bikes. A lot of people do when we get our licenses oh, or right. when our friends get our license. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then we forget about them because we're above that in a sense. But then, like, I love that I got back to it. I feel like a lot of people would, <clears throat> that, including me, like, I shut it down for a long time because I thought I was, like, I'm too old for bikes. Right. <laughs> like, I'm old. Oh, it's right. not the case, obviously, but. Almost yeah. uh, there in Indiana, there's a, <clears throat> there's almost nowhere to ride. Like if you don't have a car or anything, it's just like neighborhoods and sidewalks. So up in Indy, there's like Town Run Trail, Southwest Way Park, and then Griffin Bike Park about an hour away. So it kind of gets you out and about, but it's like legit trails. Um, but yeah, after that first bike ride, I was hooked. And then three bike rides, three bike rides later in Terre Haute Griffin Park, uh, we rode for about eight hours, and I rode the entire day, it whooped me. I was like, whew, all right, hmm, how can I be better? So uh, I smoked cigarettes for 14 years. I crushed my cigarettes, didn't even smoke another one. Like, 100% I truthful, didn't smoke another cigarette, crushed them bad boys, boom. Um, changed my diet, did everything possible to get better at bikes. And uh, everything just like, Everything led to a, like just to a point of which this is what I need to do to be happy. <laughs> do you feel like if you didn't bike, you would be in a whole different 
not good place? Oof. Oh yeah. Well, I just not like you were in sort of a not good right. Path. I was in a rut. Like I didn't have the mind for adventure. I was too heavy for adventure. Like you have to be two fifty for zip lining or horseback riding or to skateboard or to do really to to move. You have to be a certain weight limit. So whenever I was that weight, like I thought I was so limited. So once I lost the weight, that was the hardest thing I've ever done. If I can do that, you bet I can send it down like Breckenridge snowboarding or I can longboard. I'll probably pick up surfing rather easily. Like, oh yeah. So um, it just taught me that if I can do the hardest thing ever, which was lose like 220 pounds and just keep it off, boom. It's time to seize the day and just live. What know? is it? Was it like for you to meet a guy like Dan who's on a different oh. mission? Ever since I moved to Colorado, it's so like I got put on house arrest for three years, and I instantly I was like, I'm gonna make the best of everything. My personal trainer told me to read this book, Zen Empowerment. Um, just teaches you how to think. So come from love, come like just from the right place of heart. So like just be open to everything. So whenever Dan came up, and he was just so easy to talk to, I was like, man, this guy's awesome. And then I found out about his cause, like suicide prevention. Like what? Like. It's really the best thing you could do for somebody. I mean, with your so, grandma's um, history, that's really powerful. Yeah. Right? So I just believe the world just like happens for a reason and just lines up. Not necessarily like shame on you or good on you. Like it ju it's just going to happen. So just, you know, just take the... <laughs> the, yeah, the yeah. Well, we weren't even... This was just planned yeah. recently and it came up today that you guys are oh, going to yeah. come over together and... Here we are, John. Now is this gonna be you and I? Now we get to meet Kyle and right. Yeah. Well, I think it was what this morning or last night. I think it was. Uh, we were trying to plan to come and have our thing because I'm leaving tomorrow right. for Seattle to go finish the last dates. And uh, you know, I was here back in November visiting. Right. And it just didn't work out the week I was here then. So yeah, the fact that I was like, hey, I'm gonna be a little busy tomorrow, trying to do an interview with a guy that's lost like 200 plus pounds, You're like. Bring him with you. Yeah, so, and here we are. And here we are. So we ended up, luckily, we rode 10 miles here today. And, yeah. Uh, when we're done here and everything, we're going to ride 10 miles back together. But Well, let's get some food in you guys before we do that. But before we like, wrap up, let me let me give you a chance to talk about your your foundation, your your organization, and some of the people that are helping make this happen with your sponsors and other folks. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, for anybody that wants to follow my journey, definitely check out com. There you can see my maps. Uh access to all my social media for YouTube, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and all that stuff. Um, but you can also see um, my sponsors, that uh, all their links for them, and just a lot of different awesome resources on there. Um, for Ride with Daniel USA, I've been really lucky to get a few sponsors on this journey, especially since the accident, uh, to rebuild. So, uh, And a few of them are from my home state, Massachusetts. And so Sine Wave Cycles is a uh, organization or a company that does uh, the electronics on bicycles. So they, Sine Wave, yeah. They do uh, the, the dyno hubs and the auxiliary stuff for that. So they hooked me up on their products. And then um, I have Burn, which is uh, the helmet company I use. Uh, I reached out to them. I've been using their helmets as I started cycling. They're based out of Plymouth, Massachusetts, the area I'm from. And so when I reached out to them, told them about my accident and how really – if I wasn't wearing that helmet, I think it would have been a lot worse. Yeah. Because uh, it's a hard hel it's a hard shell helmet. It's not like uh, it's like a ski helmet, right? Yeah, it's like a, a snowboard and style helmet. Okay. And so it was really built for taking impact. And so I told them I was gonna buy their helmet if they didn't give me one. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, well, we love your passion for it. We love your cause. We're gonna help you out. Cool. And so that, that helped me out a lot. Uh, I actually have uh, Namaste Healing Essential oils and salves that helped me out. They've been my sponsor since. Like before I even left on my initial journey, um, and they're based out of Massachusetts, and it's CBD products, okay, um, which I use a lot more now because of my knees, and um, yeah, I have actually a few more, but uh, I, I lost them off the top of my head. But for anybody that's really struggling and wants to check out my organization, uh, the One Pedal at a Time movement, they can check out OPAT O P A A T Movement dot com, uh, and anybody that is struggling or if you know anybody that's struggling, check out OPAT movement.com forward slash there dash is dash help uh there's like 50 or 60 different resources on there for um learning education for somebody that's not suicidal that wants to be part of the su making suicide safer communities and then vice versa somebody that is struggling that is looking uh for resources or guidance and help um depending on where you are in that journey uh there's different resources for that so i want you to i want you to pretend there's two people watching this right now one is a parent of a kid that they think might be suicidal, 
and the other is a kid that might be suicidal, what would you tell them? Well, uh, be, on either side, if you're struggling, be willing to listen, uh, be willing to talk, uh, especially if you're struggling. Like, I feel like so many of us, uh, especially as kids or even adults, we hold so much in, we feel like we have to take care of ourselves or that somebody's not going to understand where we're coming from. And uh, a lot of times we think that we have to go to certain people. So, you know, I, I, t I encourage people to go. If, if you feel like you only have two people that you can tell, go tell 10 strangers. And, mm. and I tell people all the time, at least one person out of those 10 are going to help you. And realistically, six out of 10 are going to help you. And the reason the other four may not, because they're probably struggling with their own struggles mm. or they don't know how to help and they don't want to. Like you come down the wrong path. So that's really the reason why. Um, so talk. talk. Yeah, talk. Bring up, talk about what's going on. Yep. Express yourselves. Yep. I feel like so many of us have lost touch on expressing ourselves and feeling comfortable on what we have to say and what we have done that we, um, a lot of times we feel ashamed about it in, in certain ways. But on the other note, for somebody that, you know, a parent, a friend, anybody that's out there that knows somebody struggling, be willing to listen. That's the biggest thing. Be willing to listen um, without judgment. That's a hard thing for a lot, a lot of people to do. Is um, and it's not really judgment that we do. It's we're judging people because of, we're judging ourselves in a sense. Right. So um, a lot of people, you know, will, will say, "Oh, I have a, I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of issues. I, I've been I'm, I'm stuck on drugs. I'm, I'm on cocaine." And that person that's listening. It's like, I've never done that. You, you should, I can't believe you do that stuff. Right, right. Oh, my God. You're better off not doing it. Because they immediately they're putting it in their perspective. Right. And so I think a lot of times we just need to have an open mind for that. Um, and not just be willing to listen. You don't have to have all the answers. Right. Um, you know, you don't have to be the person to find all the resources. Find the resources with the person that's struggling. Be there with them. Help them in the process. Um, because really, it's like, with addictions or anything in life, you, you can't help somebody unless they're willing to help themselves. Right. So, um, and a lot of times people that are in that act of suicide, not always, but a lot of times there's signs, there's re ways to see that. And so for anybody that's, you know, wants to make, you know, we all know somebody that's struggling with suicidal thoughts in one part of another in our lives, whether they commit suicide or not. Somebody that we know has thought about suicide. So if we want to help make it better, we, we ought to start somewhere. And so that's another uh, thing that I encourage is a start program. I'm affiliated with a, an organization called Living Works. Living Works, um, okay. And we have a start program that, you know, just shows you the basics on how to see signs and um, be aware and be aware yeah. of the people around you. We can't save the world, but we can save the people around us. Well, that's, that's good advice. Appreciate that. And thanks to you guys for being vulnerable and, and coming on the show and sharing some things that aren't always easy. And yeah, and it's been great to meet you and um, look forward to maybe seeing you on the trail someday. And Absolutely. And then, and, hey, if, uh, for anybody that's interested in that START program, they can check out start.opatmovement.com. Start, okay. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks again, guys, and let's go have some food. Absolutely. <laughs> so I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. I enjoyed being part of it. I really enjoyed connecting with Kyle. And Bill, you know, Bill and me have been trying to get together for a while now, uh, ever since me and Kim. So, you know, it was really awesome to finally get the opportunity to, to spend some time with them. Uh, and Kyle, you know, I, I wish him the best. His story was so inspiring. Now, if you could do something to transform your life, I would highly recommend to find something that you're passionate about. Obviously, for me and for Kyle, cycling is our passion. We love it. It's changed our lives. It's transformed our lives. So go out there and find what is your passion and live it and enjoy it. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Copyright, OPAT Movement, 2021.